and good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome again to the School of Media and Communication. Welcome to Taylor's University. We have again our adjunct professor, film writer, film critic and film historian, none other than Pa'asan Mutalib. He was with us just last night with the master students in the Asian cinema module. We were talking about um, Malaysian cinema, how it all started until the new wave in Kuala Lumpur. And this morning, we are actually in the class of audience studies, the module of audience studies, where we are actually, the subject is actually film studies. And this time it's for the undergrads. And for your information, Pak Asan, welcome again. A very good morning to you. Good morning. For your information, Pak Asan, this module is not just for the communication students. They come from all over. We have students from uh, psychology, taking the psychology degree, from business, uh, from culinary, uh, from all over, Pak Asan, um, yeah. because this is an elective um, subject, elective module, but they are here for the love of cinema and actually registered students for this module is almost 100, Pak Asan, 97. No, but uh, looking at the number of participants, it's standing at uh, 61, so minus you and me. So for now, it's uh, 59. And we have members of the public as well. So I will um, hand over to you, Pak Hassan, um, to start because mm. uh, we don't have time. We only have one hour. And you want to start by um, by uh, playing the video, isn't it, Pak Hassan? Yeah, let's play the video of uh, Black Widow directed by Uwe Haji Shari. And uh, it's a six minute long uh, sequence uh, with only uh, three shots, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I'll share that, Pakistan. Okay, play. Okay, hold on, yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, hold on. Okay, great. Um, uh, I had that uh, video being played just to give you an idea of what we are going to go into. It's a setup for what I'm going to say about Ms. Zong Zen. So uh, I call it the silent narrative, which means there are no words. So you have to figure out what the visuals mean. Next slide, please. Okay, these are the images from uh, Black Widow just now. Uh, you can see that it began with a color shot of the main uh, character <coughs> uh, called uh, uh, Ayu. Uh, no, no. What's the name? Yeah, I think her name was Ayu. Ayu. So yeah. it begins with her name and we know that this is the story of this girl. And then there is a dissolve to her mother. It's in black and white. So black and white probably means that I know this was taken a long time ago. Sometimes it can also mean the person has passed away. And black and white, uh, the signifier is always that something is negative because we see the world in color. And the next shot is obviously the father, but separated from her mother. Uh, you can see uh, in, the, in the way the shot is taken uh, that he is uh, probably, they are divorced or he's dead. <clears throat> And then we see the post, uh, very pretentious as compared to the ma mother and the daughter. That says something about his character. And the next shot, or rather the continuation of that shot, is uh, uh, wedding photos of the two of them. And it's so boring. It could have been very much better. It says something about the character. Then the camera continues moving. And notice that the camera is going up and down, up and down. So in a sense, signifying that this is a family living in this uh, uh, traditional uh, Malay house and they have their ups and downs in their lives and that is what we are going to be seeing after this. Then we don't see the father anymore. So probably it's a divorce or he's dead. And uh, then uh, we see the mother and the daughter. Uh, they are very close. So this is what we call in just psychology of perception, proximity. When two people are in proximity, it means even without any words uh, that they are very close uh, and they have no problems at all. And we also see her when she was in school. Then uh, we see them again in proximity sitting on the steps. And then the camera moves again. We see... Uh, the mother being alone, standing at the window. Another signifier that uh, she is probably waiting for her daughter. Because looking out the window is looking out the road and so on. And uh, obviously, we can see from the uniform of the daughter that she is some kind of an air hostess. So the mother waits and she always comes back. So we see them together. And then the camera comes to the window. It's a very nice uh, a curtain and uh, very feminine. And the camera shows uh, an oil palm estate. You don't need much brains to be working in an oil palm estate. So that is also something that says about the character and uh, possibly the father uh, who is no more. Then there is a plane flying. So we can connect this with the uniform of the girl. Then there's a dissolve <clears throat> to bed sheets. And we see uh, the heroine lying in a fetal position on the bed. Now, I see this as a continuation of the ending of Uwe's first film, Isri Perempuan and dot, 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 where uh, the woman, Zaleha, dies and she falls in a fetal position. So, in a sense, Ayu is reborn. So, it's a continuation of the same theme that uh, Uwe has been uh, uh, using Throughout all his films. Next slide, please. Yeah. Before that, Pastor, it is interesting. Uh, my observation here is that um, at the very beginning, at the very start of this module, um, at the start of the semester, uh, the students watched the famous film Cinema Paradiso. Mm -hmm. um, and if you remember, Pastor, uh, the start of the film, it, the, the 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 frame is from outside 
showing the sea yes. and then slowly and uh, in the foreground yes yes and then dollying out into the house into the room mm-hmm. and, and showing the mother and the sister uh, yes. whereas this one it's from inside going out uh, do you have any comments on that yeah so uh, 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 the the window in a sense is the cinema frame that uh, we are going to see the story of these people uh, what actually went on what is the back story and so on in cinema paradiso uh, the sea signifies two things it could be one of two things one, one is the terrible mother which kills and the other one is the origin of life so the hero comes back and he will uh, discover uh, the things that uh, he left behind 30 years before and then it is such a tragedy for even for the audience uh, to see uh, why he left uh, for rome and never came back until the mother called him back so you see in a sense uh, the the sea is a symbol of also of purity and of being reborn again to discover the things that he has uh, uh, left behind yeah so it's not just for the sake of beauty eh pak san having oh, this no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, there is a flute to this and you see there's absolutely no dialogue so it is uh, the silent narrative in action yeah so this is how a director has to think think in visuals yeah including okay. a writer yeah thank you pak san and in uh, who is uh, uh, film jogo or champion which is uh, based on a novel also uh, the first shot is the sky and the camera comes down and then it shows a peri field that is not been uh, worked and then the camera slowly moves uh, to a graveyard and we hear the chanting of uh, of the talking uh, the rites the last rites being read and in the foreground we see women who are separated from the men so in uh, the sky is a signifier of god or something spiritual which is god has given you bounty which is the uh, land but you are not working the land instead you are gambling at, at uh, bull fighting and then one of them gets shot because of a saw loser so what uwe is saying is if the malays do are not careful they kill uh, they Uh, quarrel among themselves and then they end up killing one one another and then your land will be lost to other people so the enemy is within it is not outside and the women who are more intelligent than the men in this story are actually uh, actually can't do anything they are separated from the men and the men don't listen to them uh, and that is why they are separated like that and seen from the back this is a negative uh, index next and the last scene is going back to the first scene where uh, the main character has been arrested by the police uh, he did not kill anybody it was uh, that young man wearing white in the in the in the background now he was hiding behind the women only after the police had gone he comes out and the shot is from the back a negative uh, index and uh, he is going to take over uh, the household and the community what kind of man is he going to be so this is another theme of uwe about the younger generation how are they going to change the condition that they are in so the camera then moves out and then it goes back to the peri field and then up to the sky that means nothing has changed this community is lost it can't uh, uh, progress anymore next please so mizon sen is the director's crowd Mise en scène is a French term originally from uh, the stage and it uh, is pronounced mise en scène and uh, it means how you arrange things within the frame uh, uh, on the left on the right and uh, near the camera far away from the camera uh, the costume the casting uh, what the look of the character everything that is within the frame including the sound after editing so it is not only when the director is directing it is also after it's finished we see everything and then the meaning uh, that is sometimes hidden will come out to you if it has been done properly next so the director has uh, as only these two things either he follows the rule or he breaks the rule 
Uh, I will explain later what, what are the rules. Next. So here are some frames uh, from films. Uh, and you can see that the storytelling here, the visual storytelling here is very cinematic. What do we mean by cinematic? It's the way the director uses the camera. Everything he sees is from the point of view of the camera. Therefore, he has got to have a very advanced understanding of cinematography, uh, sound, uh, acting, costuming, production design, everything. And he knows more than everyone in the production, except that he's not able to do their uh, job uh, from the technical point of view. But as far as the visual is concerned, he can even tell the cameraman, the editor, and so on, how things should be done. Next. So in mise-en-scene, your shots should not only be beautiful or spectacular. They should be meaningful. And it is narrative. So I look upon cinematography, uh, editing, sound, and everything that is involved as narrative, not technique. So this is why I am able to lecture to cinematographers, editors, and sound men, and uh, production designers. So here you can see scenes from uh, uh, many, many famous films uh, like Life of Pi, uh, Skyfall, Gladiator, and so on. You can see how the cinematographer who understands how the story should be told through the visuals. Next. So cinematic storytelling is all about structuring, patterning, and organization. Everything is 100% planned. Nothing happens by chance. Next. So about following the rules and breaking the rules. These are short, these are two shots of two people, short reverse shot. But why is the second shot, the break the rules, the woman is framed in the center of the frame. Normally, a uh, cinema okay. will... Uh, Sorry? Uh, can, can you mute yourself? Okay. Hello. That? Okay. Okay. Uh, on, I think I would just have to remove this person. <laughs> okay. So you can see the woman is framed in the center as compared to the man uh, where the rule of thirds is being applied. Why is that? That means there is something wrong uh, in, uh, between these two people. So either the woman uh, is a very negative person or she is going to cause the downfall of the man. This is from the film, uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Actually, they broke the rule in another way. The woman actually is the, uh, the positive person. The man is not. So this is a very good example of how that once you know the rules, you can break the rules. So the man looks like a nice guy uh, in terms of casting. The light is uh, very nice on his face compared to the woman where she is backlit and uh, her face is in shadow. So our mind, uh, our brain looks at form. Uh, what comes out is the form and uh, that immediately we do not uh, side with the woman, but we side with the man. So that is the rule. But in this uh, context, the woman is a very progressive person. She is a leftist. So therefore, she is framed in the center and the man is very conservative. So you see, there are many ways uh, uh, to do your mise-en-scene, but most important is follow the rules. That's what you learn in dip at the diploma level. But in degree level, you have to go a bit more higher. Next, please. So there you, you have it. See, center framing and a rule of thirds. Next. So the secret is follow the rules. Only then can you break the rules. But do not forget that you must always come back to the rules. A very good example is the exercise uh, in cinematography about uh, setting the line and then uh, go, uh, crossing the line. I'm sure you must have done that. Eh? So first of all, <coughs> you set the line between two people. Then 
you cannot be uh, in the 180 degree rule all the time. Only when a third uh, when a third person comes in, now you cross the line, but do not cross that line. Okay, so I'm sure you have learned all of this. So this is the uh, the secret to mise en scène uh, uh, that follow the rules, and it means everything is okay in this particular scene, uh, no conflict, nothing at all. But when something is beginning to go wrong, now you have to start to think about how to break the rules to give the audience a feel about what is going to happen. But later, once everything is okay, you must come back to the rule. So this is the three act structure. The hero, according to Joseph Campbell, uh, uh, story paradigm. Uh, the hero is in his ordinary world. Then he goes into the special world, which is not used to. But at the end, he comes back to his ordinary world, but he is not the same person anymore. He's much wiser. Next. Okay, Pastor, I just want to be naughty here and ask you yeah. <laughs> two questions. Okay. You know, sometimes people say, uh, now and again, we, we hear people say, uh, what's so important about following the rules? Uh, mm. um, it's only filmmakers who know the rules and not all filmmakers. And why is it so important? Because the audience, they don't know the rules. So, you know, it, does it matter to them if we follow the rules? What's your opinion, uh, Pastor? The audience does not need to know all these technical things, the theories and so on. They need to feel. If you cannot make the audience feel and only appeal to their thinking power, you have lost your audience. So many famous filmmakers have said more or less the same thing, that you have to make the audience feel. Mm. But following the rule is very important because that's part of the film language. So I'll be uh, going into details after this. So, so uh, are you then saying, Pasan, that when the filmmaker follows the rules, Although the audience they don't know the rules or understand the rules, but they will be able to feel it um, unconsciously yes, or subconsciously. Because, yeah, uh, then you have something called binary opposition or binary contrast. Uh, following the rule will be contrasted with breaking the rule. So if it is repeated in a certain manner, the audience will definitely get it. But the problem is many filmmakers don't understand this. They do things according to how they feel. That's that's wrong. Okay, we move on. Thank you, Pazan. Okay, next. So there are two things in filmmaking, storytelling and story making. Storytelling is the story. Story making is the technique. Next. So in storytelling, these are the elements. Idea, theme, story, characters, treatment, script, story sketch for animation, and then storyboard. Next. And uh, Ingmar Bergman, the Swedish filmmaker, has said, if you want to know what a filmmaker is saying, look at how he's saying it. That means he's asking you to look at the technique, the mise-en-scene of the director. And Noam Chomsky has said, don't look at what's presented to you, look at how it's presented. Then you will know the truth. He was specifically talking about the media and television, how uh, that's why the media, uh, there's a mediation. Uh, the person who is mediating is the person who decides what you should see and what you should not see. Okay, next. So, film grammar is what you see on the screen. Film language is what is hidden and it needs to be interpreted. But the audience uh, has got no time to do the interpretation. So, therefore, it has to be the film grammar has got to be structured in such a manner that the audience can feel things and sometimes is uh, uh, aided by uh, music and so on, or fast cutting, things like that. Okay, next. So I will introduce you to four theories, which are not in film. Uh, archetypes is from Carl Jung's uh, the, psycho, uh, psych, uh, the psychoanalyst theories. Semiotics is from Charles Peirce and um, uh, it actually comes from literature and uh, also linguistics. Then binary opposition is from Prot Levi Strauss, a structural anthropologist. And the start principles of uh, psychology is from psychology, uh, a group of uh, psychologists and uh, artists in the year 1912 got together to discuss how is it that when you are confronted with a uh, artwork, the audience can understand the intention uh, of the uh, artist or the filmmaker. Okay, next. 
this may seem very strange to you, but it's important that you hear it. And after this, you will come, come across these words and then you can go on to self-study. Yeah. So let me uh, show you what is film grammar in cinematography. There is also film grammar in editing, film uh, grammar in uh, art uh, uh, production design and also in sound. So the first thing that the cinematographer wants to know from the director is where do I place the camera? From the front, take the shot from the front or from the side or from the back. Now, every one of this has got its own specific meaning. Later, I will uh, uh, explain to you. Next. The next thing that the cinematographer wants to know, what shot size do I need to take? From extreme long shot, long shot, full shot, medium shot, uh, close up, uh, uh, medium close up, medium long shot, and big close up. And this also has got its own individual meaning. Next. The next thing the cameraman wants to know is the camera angle. Do I take it at eye level? Next. Below eye level, where you can see the ceiling. Next. Or low angle, where you can also see the ceiling, uh, ceiling more clearly. Next. Or above eye level, where you can see the ground. Next. And then, of course, the focal length. Will you be? Uh, uh, should he use a normal lens, which is about thirty-five? <coughs> sorry, about fifty to fifty-five millimeter, or a wide-angle lens, or a telephoto lens? Every one of this gives you a different kind of image, and this will affect the audience. And it only affects the audience once it goes into editing. That you go from one shot to the other shot immediately the audience can feel something is different. Next. So lighting is the next one. Should you use high key or low key or a mix or make it really, really dramatic and you see the sequence here from a very nice shot uh, with a nice lighting, slowly we begin to see the light is changing until we come to the final shot where the character is in silhouette. Now. This is all dependent on that particular point of your story, what is actually happening here. And the good cinematographer, after he reads the script, he knows exactly how to shoot it. But unfortunately, many cinematographers do not study film. You have to study film before you go into cinematography. Then only can you uh, help the director to visualize what he wants. Next. So here you can see a, a shot from a film, uh, an unfinished film of a friend of mine. This reference was Rembrandt, the paintings of Rembrandt, where the character fades into the background. So uh, this is uh, into film noir and German expressionism, where you are not sure as to uh, who this person is. Is he the good guy or is he the bad guy? Uh, the, both the good guys and the bad guys are lit in a similar manner. So it is very ambiguous. Next. Uh, here, if, uh, the first two shots are from the wedding planner and uh, second two shots are from a Shah Rukh Khan film called The Pen that I really uh, recommend you to see because it's so unusual. It is Bollywood kicking themselves in the butt. Very cleverly <laughs> done. And the last two shots is from a Korean television uh, series and uh, you can see that the lighting, the framing and the shots uh, are all separated. These two people, people are talking to each other but why they are close to each other but why are they separated through the shots and the editing? That means something is not right. So it is in editing that you begin to see the story taking place and this is why editing is called the second directing. Next. And this is from the film The Equalizer. Uh, do you think this guy is a good guy? He's the same person on the right. So the lighting uh, tells you he is not the good guy because half his face is, is in shadow. He has gone over to the dark side. So the next shot is of him without his shirt. He has got tattoos on his body. Now the camera is above him and he is stretching 
stretching and he looks like a python. And this already is a signifier at the beginning of the film. This is a bad guy. There's no way he's going to be a good guy. And see Equalizer, one of the best films, I think, uh, for drama uh, that I've seen. And Denzel Washington is a great actor. Next. And this is from an Indonesian film. Uh, there's a lack of communication between the people in, the, uh, in front, the father and mother, and the daughter. So how is the mise-en-scene uh, done? Uh, the first shot is of the TV screen or the co computer monitor. Anything that you see in a photo or in a TV screen or in a cinema screen within the frame is, a, is artificial. It's a negative signifier. And the daughter is sitting away from them. And this is what we call limited space. So space that is a, a, a limited space, a deep space, and so on. Uh, and they have all different meanings, and the, and there's one point perspective, which is an, another negative uh, indication. So the father and mother are very far distance, not only physically, but also in many many things. And the daughter cannot uh, react to them. Next. So film grammar in cinematography is about camera position, shot size, camera angle, focal length, camera modes, and lighting. So the director needs to understand how the camera takes uh, shoots the scene. In production design, it's about line, surface, texture, color, pattern, and organization. So how are uh, how is the setting, uh, exterior and interior arranged in such a manner, and everything that is within the frame has got a reason to be there. You don't simply shoot it. And uh, today, with uh, tech, uh, digital technology. You can remove many things. For instance, if the film is set in the 1950s and certain things in the frame uh, should not be there, they can just you know uh, take it out. In editing, <clears throat> it's about a short take or a long take, or a continuity editing, or jump cuts or disjunctive, and optical effects like uh, white, dissolve, fade, and things like that. So that's the film grammar for editing. In sound, it is diegetic sound, non-diegetic sound, or meta-diegetic sound. Diegetic sound means you see a person and you hear him talking. Uh, uh, you, someone is playing a violin and you hear the sound of the violin. But in non-diegetic sound, you, that you see a person uh, listening, but you don't see the person who is talking to him. Uh, in non-diegetic, uh, sorry, uh, in meta-diegetic sound, Someone is just sitting there and uh, think like he's thinking. And then we hear on the soundtrack a uh, sound of children, maybe a, a sound of musical instrument or cars on the road. It means he's uh, going into his memory. So every one of all these things has got a specific meaning. For example, if you do a long take, that is part of a... Uh, uh, what do you call the uh, mise-en-scene. So here I have to digress a bit. Now, uh, Eisenstein in the 1920s came up with this theory, the montage theory, and it is truly based on philosophy, the Marxist Hegelian principle. You don't have to remember this. Uh, he said that, uh, uh, it says that when thesis collides with antithesis, it produces synthesis. Uh, in simple terms, you take one idea, you collide it with a totally different idea, a new idea comes out. For example, you have someone in, the, in jail, the camera is taking him from outside and he's holding on to the bars of the jail in the window. Then you cut to a shot where a bird is flying. What is the meaning that comes out from that? The juxtaposition of images that he wants to be free, isn't it? But you see, the two shots were taken at two different locations at two different times. But through editing, they come together as if they were in the same time frame. So this is the magic of editing. But For your information, Pak Azan, yeah. uh, earlier on in the semester, I shared with the students uh, when we were talking about film, the history of film. Mm -hmm. So I did go uh, slightly a bit into the Soviet montage. Okay. And um, I showed uh, uh, the famous clip of, uh, you remember the uh, runaway um, a baby stroller coming down the steps? 
Ah yes yes. Yeah, so the students did watch that. So um, <laughs> if you can, if you want to talk uh, in reference to that, you can also do that for your information. Yes. So uh, according to Eisenstein, not, film is nothing but montage. That means sequence of shots that create something. And even another filmmaker, uh, I think it was Polishov or Hudovkin, where he had a shot, of, or maybe it was Eisenstein, where he had the shot of a peacock spreading its feathers. And it cuts to a politician uh, talking. That means uh, the politician is talking uh, nonsense. Uh, that's supposedly what comes out. But in the 1940s, when uh, Andre Bazin came in, he said, no, film is not montage. It is mise-en-scene, which means it's a long take, sometimes of 10 minutes. Uh, they could only take 10 minutes because the film's, uh, film reel was only 10 minutes long. And he said, leave it to the audience to make sense of what is happening. And therefore, through production design, through acting, and through movement, I, the audience is, gets involved in the storytelling and uh, they make, make sense of everything. But today, we are actually using both the montage theory and the mise-en-scene theory. So that's another uh, take on mise-en-scene. Okay, next. So this is uh, something that I worked out. Uh, you can't find it in any book. So I've mentioned to you about film grammar. And now those four elements that I mentioned, those four theories, archetypes and so on, you have to make use of this. In fact, you are already making use of this whenever you do a painting, a drawing, you take a shot and so on. So archetypes is there, semiotics is there, binary opposition is there, and the gestalt psychology principles are there. Except that you did not know the theory behind it. Once you know the theory, you will go upwards. Without it, you will go just sideways. So I strongly recommend that you go into this, uh, but not too deeply. Only a very basic understanding. It took me about 20 years to understand this because I never went to film school and I had to learn it on my own. But I was, um, uh, the cinema, the theater was my university where I saw 300 films a year during my bachelor days. And I had a book where I noted things down. And then I began to realize that what filmmakers are doing is recycling things. They are not actually coming up with something new. It's recycling. But as time goes on and technology uh, comes into play, they can do wonderful things. They can come up with new film languages. And there is a book that I recommend, New Vocabularies in Film Semiotics. It's very academic. And of course, uh, Gilles Deleuze, you should go and read his Cinema 1 and Cinema 2, but only at PhD level. Okay, <laughs> next. So what comes out once you have all these thin elements? It's form. So let me give you an example, an analogy. Uh, I'm sure you have seen all these big ceramic vases in Chinese uh, medicine shops. So if you look at one from a distance, it looks nice. The form is good, uh, the shape is good, and uh, the colors and the, and the drawings of the flowers are beautiful. But once you come near, you see some uh, slight cracks here and there, and some color has faded. But from a distance, it still looks good. So this is what a film is about, that there may be problems here and there, but if they are minor, it doesn't affect the form of the film, you will enjoy the film. But if there are too many flaws here and there, they are not structured properly, and you hate the film, and the, of course the critics will come in and bash the film, and saying, so this film is totally uh, of rotten tomatoes. All right? So... Uh, what is important is, if you know these theories, you can question yourself and correct yourself when you are writing the script, when you are doing pre-production, when you are directing, and when you are editing. Next. So this is the screen uh, divided uh, with all this uh, left, left, uh, right, top, bottom, and center. So this film space is also connected to time. It does not stand by itself. It's not a painting. It's not a photograph. Therefore, you have to understand that here what we have is X and Y. Next. Then we have 
the Z or Z. Uh, it, it is flat space, limited space, and deep space. And there's also another one called implied space, which a bit too advanced. Next. So this is the example. The flat space uh, where the camera is taking a shot head on. Many directors do this, but cinematographers try to avoid it. They will give it some perspective. The next one is limited space, where you have space in the foreground and then space at the back, and uh, you can see the separation. Deep space is one point perspective, and it is always found in films that are of uh, thrillers and action or in very dramatic scenes, and especially in horror movies. So later I'll give you some examples. Next. So back to this, effective storytelling using mise-en-scene makes use of these four theories. So again, I would advise you, don't go too deep into it unless uh, you want to become a, a writer or a, a researcher. So let's see what are these. Next. So archetypes from Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. So Joseph Campbell uh, did his work uh, based on the theories of Carl Jung. So archetypes are the roles that the character plays in the story. So instead of giving names to the characters, we can call them by the work that they do uh, in the story. For instance, when I say uh, a pilgrim, immediately a picture comes into your mind or someone holding a staff, maybe he's wearing a robe and then uh, he's traveling with a, a sack on his uh, shoulder and so on. Uh, if I say a banker, uh, obviously, you will imagine a character wearing coat and tie, looking very officious, and uh, he may be a little bit overweight uh, because sitting too much in the name, and so on. And if I say uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a tramp, immediately uh, Charlie Chaplin comes into your mind, or someone uh, living by the roadside with torn clothing, and so on. So, archetypes are characters which are very easily identified. And in life, it is the same thing. For instance, <coughs> uh, you have people that we call the lecturer, the student, the father, mother, king. And uh, 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 events are like uh, the convocation where everybody is dressed in robes and they walk very solemnly. And then uh, the names are called officially and you don't break any rules here. So that's exactly like what happened in the ancient days when the king calls for an audience. So it's exactly the same thing that be, is being recycled. So rituals, uh, for instance, uh, you can have a shot of uh, uh, savages dancing up and down around a fire. And if you cut to a shot in a nightclub where young people are jumping up and down doing a dance, is there any difference? We don't call it a ritual, yeah. but there is a similarity. Modern day ritual, Pasan. Yeah. Modern day ritual. Ah, modern day. <laughs> uh, assisted, assisted by artificial substances. <laughs> uh, and it actually has no meaning as compared to the savages. So we couldn't, shouldn't call the savages savages. Why? Because it's part of their culture and it is rooted in, in, the, in, the, in their religious beliefs. Okay, next. So let's uh, see some examples. Immediately by looking at this, you see all these are icons. I don't have to explain to you, isn't it? So you know that is Moses and that is uh, Ramesses in the Ten Commandments. And here is a priest and compared to maybe the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, anybody whose face you cannot see, you are very worried of this uh, person. And they have sharp points, danger signs in, a, in, a, in your mise en Next. And on the left, uh, you see I don't know whether it's the same person, but a university graduate and another one who probably works as a mechanic. Immediately, it's clear to you. So they are icons and uh, we identify them by their dress and the way they look. Uh, what, what is it that they do? And in uh, the Malaysian film directed by Piram Lee called Pendeka Bujang Lapo, we see the two main characters. The man on the left are holding the cock hat and the cane and dressed like in West, uh, Western clothes, is the bad guy, who is a capitalist, who is arrogant, compared to this old man on the right side, who is a silat master, and uh, look at the way he stands, very, uh, uh, he, he is 
in a sense, he has power. And he wears this uh, hat, which is opposite to the hat of the man. So this is binary opposition. And uh, we see the sea behind him. So here the sea again is the origin of life. That he is uh, a part of the primordial. Next. And from Star Wars, we see two characters who are in contrast. So we identify Luke Skywalker as the hero and Darth Vader as the bad guy. So very clearly, we identify them by the roles they play through their costumes and so on. Next. So archetypes, uh, you have to understand the character. And this is important for actors and also for people in animation who design characters. First thing is uh, you've got to understand physically how they look like because uh, the form comes across the audience immediately. They won't go for detail yet. So if you look at Skywalker just now, immediately you identify him as the hero because he wears white and he stands in the stunts in the shape of a triangle, which is a very stable uh, shape. Then professional uh, aspect, which is what work does he do? So the way he dresses, the way he looks, also points to that. Sociological, how does he behave with his family, with his uh, uh, friends, uh, with his boss, uh, with his fellow workers, or with society? Then the psychological aspect, how will he behave in a normal uh, situation? How will he behave in a crisis? Will he be the same? So if he is a hero, he will, he will be more or less the same. But sometimes he might lose his bearing but then he, might, he may realize it. So you have to explore your character from the, that psychological point. Spiritual is very important, even in an animation film. So in The Lion King, uh, <clears throat> is based on Hamlet. Simba is affected psychologically, and then he runs away, leaving the throne. He's destined to be the next Lion King, and uh, the spiritual aspect is from the father, telling him when he was small, looking at the stars, so in a film, stars signify destiny. So don't just simply have stars in your sky. It must be related to the theme of the film, must be related to uh, destiny, where the father tells him, uh, one day we are going to die and we will be up there guiding all the other lion kings. And then in the middle of the film, Simba is lying on the ground, with uh, on the grass with his two friends, and they discuss what are those uh, bright lights in the sky? And uh, I'm sure you remember that scene. But uh, when they ask Simba, now the psychological aspect comes into play and he is very uneasy because he starts to remember what his father told him because he was in his sub subconscious mind. And then it is, a, uh, what do you call? Uh, a part of the story which leads into to the climax. And then at the end, uh, he has dis uh, discovered himself. But there is one last thing, which is he cannot go back yet because that psychological aspect is disturbing him. Now, uh, Rafiki, the medicine man, uh, comes and uh, takes him into the underworld because only the soul of the father uh, can uh, motivate him to go back. So the father is dead and we see him in the stars. In astrology, there is what we call Leo the lion. So we see him appearing there. So you see, everything was researched. It was not just a uh, drawing. And then uh, what do you call? Uh, only the father can motivate him and not just Rafiki. So now he realizes it. So he goes back and reclaims the throne. Next. Yeah. Semiotics is from Charles Peirce. Also Roland Barthes, Ferdinand de Saussure from uh, uh, the literary studies, all basically said the same thing, so I'm using Charles Peirce. So in semiotics, there are three things. Icons, indexes, symbols. Semiotics are all about how meaning is created in a particular society by using certain elements. For instance, icon. When you show something like a tree, you don't have to explain it because we are all familiar with the tree. But in index, how do we show a three tree without showing the tree? So we can show the reflection of the tree in the water or the shadow of the tree on the ground. But we cannot see the tree yet, but we can accept it that there is a... So some filmmakers do not want to go directly by showing 
icons. They want to lead into it. Just like uh, uh, always uh, Black Widow just now, he didn't show the actual characters yet, but he showed the photographs and it was an index that there's something seriously wrong with this family that is living in this house. <coughs> so an index looks like the icon, but a symbol, it does not look at all like the index. Uh, you have to decipher it. So in filmmaking, use a lot of icons. If you are aiming for a general audience, use some indexes, but don't use symbols because it will confuse them because they're not used to it. So you have to know how would you uh, uh, present your story to different uh, target audiences. Next. So here are some examples. Taking a shot from the back means there's something wrong with this character. It's an index. It's an indication that something is wrong. And we take a big close up of the eyes. Something is not right with this character. And uh, uh, in the Iranian film on the right side, man without shadow. Uh, the first shot is uh, of this man uh, from the back and later we know he's a bad guy because there are also hooks hanging on the wall and it is one point perspective. It's like a horror movie, but it is not a horror movie. And uh, a couple uh, quarreling, running, you see again one point perspective and uh, it's actually in a documentary film uh, and it's not the way to direct uh, characters because it's too negative and the man, the husband of this woman uh, the first time he's established we see him sleeping we don't see his face again it's a negative index and when you cut the body of a person you're saying something is wrong here why do you need to go to a close up next so we see uh, the sheriff uh, he's an icon Immediately, you look at the uh, his uh, uh, arm band and uh, his hat, uh, definitely is in US, and his costume is a sheriff. But why was it shot with a shadow? So there's something negative about him. It's foreshadowing uh, what is going to happen later. In Uwe's film, Boy Laju Laju, here is a woman who has dark glasses. She's holding an umbrella which is black and red. And then her costume has got straight lines, three negative indications about her. And at the end of the film, we find that she motivated the hero to kill her husband and she runs off with his property uh, and leaving this guy in jail. So anyone who wears dark glasses is a bad guy. Uh, even if Shah Rukh can't wear the dark glasses, but he will remove it. And uh, black and red is a sign of violence. And straight lines is a negative indication, like bars in a, uh, in a, in a jail. Next. And uh, in film noir, there are a lot of icons. From the shape, we can know this is a man and this is a woman. But we cannot see their faces. So there's something wrong with them. Coupled with smoke. So smoke is a negative indication in film. So the director's mise-en-scene must be arranged in such a way that all these elements uh, transmit or communicate meaning. Yes, the they right, know about film noir, Pak Hasan. They watch Double Indemnity. Yes. So it's all about ambiguous characters. We do not know who is the good guy, who is the bad guy. And they are all headed for disaster. And film noir, the images, is as if the person is having a nightmare for something that you know he cannot get out of. So on the right side is a frame from uh, Singapore, overrun by Swordfish, uh, directed by a young man in Poland. He's from Malaysia. And uh, you see the character and the background? Uh, the straight lines are trees, but they are very prominent. So normally, the ground uh, at the back, we try to mute it. But here, he made it very prominent. Why? Because it's a signifier of the bad intention of the characters in the foreground and they're holding sharp spears and the captain on the on the left side he is overweight and he has no neck so in a film if you take someone an actor where his neck disappears he will be a bad guy and uh, you see the way he hunches and he's whispering so all these elements within the frame 
tell us something is seriously wrong here and the hero is going to be in trouble. Next. And if it's in black and white, uh, it means there's something wrong in this film. But the shot at the bottom left, why is it framed so nicely? This is from, uh, I think it was Mizoguchi's uh, uh, Legend of Bailey Sancho. <coughs> it's the young girl is going to commit suicide. Now, as I said, that signs and symbols are in a particular society. In Japan, if you harakiri or you commit suicide, you are considered to be on a very high level because it takes guts. So uh, it was framed nicely and not negatively. And uh, on the right side, you can see the it's in black and white, but it has got a positive. It is a positive signifier that this is how things were in ancient days when uh, uh, man and nature were one and the same. But Swami Baba made a mistake with uh, the shot uh, on the top right side is from the film uh, Hati Malaya, 1957, where the Malays were demonstrating against the British. But it is wrongly done. It's an extreme long shot, which is a negative indicator. And then the building is higher than the people. It's gothic. It's a gothic image. So this is a uh, wrong way of uh, transmitting uh, or communicating a message. Next. So in uh, Piramli's film, Pandeka Bujang Lapo, uh, uh, a symbol is being used. This was a very clever uh, use by Piramli, even though he didn't understand semiotics and so on. So here is the good guy squatting on the table, stealing money while people are quarreling outside. Now, there is a similarity between what he's doing and the uh, uh, ferry workers who are also stealing money from their boss. Now, he shouldn't be doing this. So the camera was on the other side and the background was the walls. And suddenly the camera crossed the line and now we see the sky dominating. The sky here represents God. God is looking upon him and he does not like what he is doing. Why? Because he is a good guy and he's going to meet the master who is going to transmit the real knowledge to him. And so God created the hole in his pocket. The money had dropped out after he, they crossed the river. So this is very, very subtle. And in Lion King, the sky represents God. And Rafiki lifts up Simba uh, for God to uh, uh, bestow upon him the, that he's going to be the next Lion King. So the sky opens and the light comes down upon him. So in a film, if there's light from the sky and or from the window uh, at the back of a person, it signifies that he is spiritual and also the stars. Next. So in Lion King, there's a lot of blue and black. So this is normally following the rule is negative. But in this sense, it is going into the next world, the underworld, where Rafiki discovers Simba is still alive. Next. <coughs> and so in the spirit world, we see the same colors uh, appearing. Oh, we are almost out of time. Huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Next. Uh, so stars are destiny. Next. We are actually of the end. In my film, Sang Kanchi Dan Monyet, I had the light coming from above to signify that there is a moral message in this world. Next. And uh, blue light and so on. And straight lines and mist. All negative indications. Next. From Majid Majidi's film. And in Cinema Paradiso, reflected image of the director of how bad he feels. Uh, remembering all those memories that when he came back. Next. And uh, reflection in a mirror is negative. So this photographer who took Siti Nur Haliza did not understand. Uh, the person has a psychological problem. Uh, that's why it means when you take a reflected image. Next. And when you have the same person in the same in the frame, it means there's something wrong with the person. Next. And if you take at night, negative. Next. And blue light, black and white, and silhouette, and uh, strange 
uh, what do you call camera angle, negative indicators. Next. And upside down. So I'm, I think we will have to stop here. If you take any uh, shot upside down, you're already saying something is wrong. Okay? If someone is lying on the ground and you take him upside, upside down, that means he will die. And if someone had a heart attack, you have to shoot him upside down when he's lying on the floor. It's a signifier that he is going to die. Okay? okay. So that's how you tell stories using mise en scène. Yeah. All right. Yes. I'm so sorry, Pasan, that our time is limited. Um, but thank you very much for all this explanation. I hope the students can digest. Actually, some of them have left because they have another class. Mm -hmm. But um, before we end this, I, I I would just like to open to 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 any students uh, for just one question. If you have any questions from the students, I think they are stunned. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you will start to remember all this when you are watching films from now on. Yes, yeah, so uh, like I mentioned to you, Pasan, um, we will. <laughs> I, I will be with the students this afternoon at two o'clock um, in the big lecture hall, um, big screen, um, good sound to watch a film that you have chosen. Would you like to say a few words? Why you? I didn't tell them what the film is, so please don't tell them what the film is. But can you give a reason? Because I was wondering as well. Why did Pasan, of all films, why did Pasan choose this film? You want to mention the title? No, don't 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 tell them what's the title. But just say why did right. you choose that film? Okay, for beginners, uh, all this thing that I mentioned is going to be a bit difficult to digest. So I just chose a mainstream cinema with popular actors that they already know and a very entertaining story. And then I'm going to analyze and go deeper into how everything was structured in the in terms of mise en scène. Uh, through the acting, through the uh, cinematography and editing and so on. So that after this, when they are watching any Hollywood movie or Bollywood movie, they will not think of it as just entertainment, but there was so much work put into it. And uh, the director will be really, really happy that you saw all that hard work that he had put in. Yeah. Okay, you have your mise en scène there as well, Pak San. Oh yes, because, yes. Uh, as we were as you were explaining, you know, you had a glimpse of the cat tail, and then you know, it was crossing the frame, and now it's entering the frame again. <laughs> I got nine cats. Yeah. Okay. So again, thank you very much, Pak San. On behalf of the students, they don't have any questions. Probably, like you said, they are stunned. So we will continue to meet them um, this afternoon uh, on campus to watch that film. Um, so again, Pak San, on behalf of the school, on behalf of the university, I thank you. Um, Pak San? It was a pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.